Good day, good people. My name is Brad King, and this is the Downtown Riders Jam video podcast, which is part of the Solid Listen Podcast Network. Max the Dog and I are coming to you from deep inside the jam bunker today, and I am just going to warn you, you are about to get scienced up today in the best possible way. My guests are doctors Sarah and Jack Gorman, which I think is the first time I've had two people on the show at one time. Uh, their book, Denying to the Grave, Why We Ignore the Facts That Will Save Us, uh, is in its second edition, and it's out right now. So I'm going to need you all to take a deep breath, because if I'm doing science, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who these folks are. So uh, Sarah Gorman, who's a doctor, uh, is in a, she's a public health specialist. Um, and she's an author who's written a whole bunch about mental health, global health, and the intersection of public health and psychology, amongst other topics. That is a very short version of, of uh, who she is. And her dad, Dr. Jack Gorman, uh, also on the show, they co-founded Critica Inc., which is a nonprofit corporation. Um, and uh, Jack is the president. Um, and it's devoted to fighting science denial and promoting the acceptance uh, of science and health and, and policy and safety decision making. So I'm going to have to use their first names because if I say Dr. Gorman, you're not going to know who I'm talking about. So Jack founded the Franklin Behavioral Healthcare Consultants in 2010, and that provides guidance to biotech companies and healthcare organizations to improve uh, the efficacy and cost effectiveness of mental health care. Um, and his expertise is in behavioral health care management and improvement, uh, psychopharmacology, psychotherapy, and clinical and basic neuroscience. And if you see me looking down, it's because I got to read this shit because this is like being on Star Trek. And lots of words that like I have heard, but like I got to be looking at them to pronounce them right. His book, Neuroscience at the Intersection of Mind and Brain, was published in 2018. These are very short bios of these two very impressive people. Um, who are writing about a topic that I think is really important, which is science denying. And it's the root of a lot of stuff we got going on today. And as a former uh, Wired and, and MIT technology review guy, that's important. So we're going to get all to that in just a couple minutes. Um, we're going to blow through this business that we always blow through. So as you know, the Jam Video Podcast comes out about every Monday and Friday. Uh, and the jam proper, the 60 minute show comes out on Wednesdays, the way you can help us spread the word, tell your friends about us and leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can pop on over to the Facebook page and leave us a review there, or you can head to the writersjam.com, leave us a testimonial through the contact page. You can also check out the video series while you're there. Uh, you can also buy the book of anybody that's been on the program, click on that little bookshop link and you can head right on over to our shop and buy a book. If you're wondering what to read, we have book reviews there, so you can check those out. And if all that's too much because you're a busy person, sign up for our newsletter. All of that will show up right in your inbox. The last thing you can do is support everybody on the Solid Listen Network. Click on that Patreon button, and for just a couple bucks a month, you'll get commercial-free episodes, happy hours, bonus content, all kinds of stuff from everybody on the network. Now I ran through some of what I would normally do here in the uh, in the introduction to the to the two writers, but I just want to say that when this came across my desk, and there's there's a couple of these coming out, um, people that had pitched trade ish books that are about science, and of course I jumped at that because my entire career as a journalist was writing about science and technology and the intersection of sort of society and, and science and technology. I did it through the lens of entertainment and I did it in some ways because that is the job that I fell into, but also I had been a pop culture and feature writer before that. And so finding that way into a story that was really big was always easier if you did it through people. And the thing that most people interact with is entertainment that eventually grew a little weary for me because we wanted to explore some other topics and there were other things that I was really interested in and so when um this book showed up and the idea of science denying and what it does uh and in particular and I think what's interesting about this book is that it is also about the psychology of why that happens and the ways in which you can talk to people 
who are in that mode, right? It's not about chastising people that feel that way. It's about understanding the forces that make that happen. And then how do you work your way through that? Because, and you know, this is going to be the most wonky conversation that I've had in the years that I've been doing this show, uh, because I think it's super important. And I will say repeatedly on the show, like, I think this is maybe one of the most important things facing this country right now. Because we all have to deal with the outcomes of people who are denying these things, whether it's gun control, whether it's uh, getting the vaccinations, any number of things that where we know the science tells us to do one thing, but it has become so politicized that people just refuse to do any of that is literally how you tear a society apart. So this conversation with these two experts was super important to me, and it is, I think, and I'm biased, one of the most interesting conversations that I've had. So I appreciate you taking some time to stop by the bunker with Max and I. I hope that your day is going well. I hope that you are taking care of yourself as you get back out there. And I hope that you will sit back and enjoy and pay attention to my conversation with doctors, Sarah and Jack Gorman. We, we both got interested in this topic sort of independently and simultaneously um, now a number of years ago. Um, you know, it, the original version of the book came out in 2016. So I, at the time, had become very fascinated by sort of the anti-vaccine movement and vaccine hesitancy as a concept. And, you know, just getting deeper into my career in public health was trying to understand why this is happening and also realizing that I thought the response to it was just basically wrong. Um, there was just so much fact checking and so much yelling at people. And I wanted to understand the psychology and sort of at the same time for, for whatever reason, I know Jack was getting interested in this question of gun ownership, actually why people own guns when it's, you know, actually more dangerous to have one in the home than not to have one. Um, and so as we started talking about these two topics, we realized that there were other topics where people were making non-science based decisions and not just that, but also really denying the scientific evidence. And unfortunately, I say unfortunately, because it's, it's not great for humanity. Um, this topic has only become more relevant, um, you know, and it, right after the book came out, Donald Trump was elected and there was this sort of you know, what people sometimes refer to as a war on science. And then of course the COVID epidemic and all of the misinformation around that has just made it more and more obvious how central this topic is. It's so weird to me because, you know, I see it on my Facebook page. I mean, I've been, I've been writing about science and technology, not as a scientist, but like right with scientists and working with them and stuff. And it really feels like up until very recently, it, I mean, there was this weird shift and like, I'll tell my friends, like we were all vaccinated. Like you literally could not go to school without get like the same thing. And there is a disconnect that they just do not put together. So it, like you were saying like fact checking and things like that didn't work. So how, like, how do you approach people that not only disagree, like it's not that they're disagreeing, it's that they're saying that's not even a thing I believe in. Either one of you, like, how do you like, how do you talk to people like that? Because this is a very important thing for us to figure out. Well, this is critical to our work together and our work uh, in our organization called Critica that we founded to try to pursue some of these ideas and that we're actually now doing that. And what we did first is we reviewed the scientific literature on what's persuasive. Um, and as Sarah said, most of these things are not fundamentally knowledge deficit. That is the people who are anti-vaxxers actually often are very sophisticated in what they know about the immune system and vaccinations. They just have ideas that are wrong that they cling to for, and we realized that, that that's an emotional factor. That's no longer a, a fact. It, it's important to supply accurate facts and we do that as well, but um, that's not the fundamental issue here. Um, and so we started exploring what are the emotional issues that cause people to cling to uh, a false narrative, a, a, something that's scientifically just untrue. Um, 
in you can see in the case of the gun ownership, for example, everybody would like to make this a Second Amendment debate or you know rights versus no rights. And our point is forget about what the Constitution says or whether you have a right to have a gun or not. Do you want to have a gun in your home? Here's here are the data that I can give you about what are the likelihood of events if you have a gun in your home. If you have a gun in your home, it's highly unlikely that you will ever use it to protect yourself. Those are the data. And highly, much more likely that someone in your household will get shot with that gun. That's just the simple facts. Now, knowing that, do you still want a gun? And the people who say, yes, I still want a gun are in a kind of science denial because the fear that they have of being assaulted is so overwhelming that they can't set that aside. And so rather than my perseverating on this fact of what the data show, I try to understand and join those people in what are you afraid of? What, what is really making you so frightened that you wanna take this step? And that's how we engage people in these conversations by trying to join with them and, and find common ground because probably what they're afraid of, we're all afraid of. It's just that we're disagreeing on what this approach should be. Yeah. And it's my sister teaches elementary school and when she has to teach probability, it always drives her up a wall because right. probability is a thing that humans are very bad at. Very bad at. We <laughs> all you know, it, it's it's um chimpanzees have exactly the same problem, it turns out, that we overestimate small risk and underestimate large risk. So we make a big deal out of you know, the tiny, tiny chance that you might get an adverse reaction to a COVID vaccine, which is, you know, one in millions of people get anything. And every day we get in our cars and we drive around without thinking twice <laughs> where the risk of getting harmed in a car crash is so much greater than anything else. Yeah. The, when, I when I worked with young journalists, I would always make them read. There's this book called The Invisible Gorilla. Uh, oh yeah yeah it's what it was one of and i'd show him the video of the grid yeah. one of my um it was one of the ways that we would talk about look part about part of writing about science and part of understanding this is that sometimes <laughs> what you think you see is not like you, you that's not what's happening and so you can't use what you think is logic because there's other stuff going on that you have to understand and that's really hard for people to wrap their head around that's right so Sarah, as you were working on, as you were uh, work, writing the book and sort of pursuing this, like what did you see? Like how, like, how do you um, see engaging with people that say maybe don't want the vaccine or, or, or think that, you know, whatever, that it's bad or that they shouldn't have it? I wanted to add that I think one thing that we, that we try to look at is the people, not the people who are at the polar edges of the issues. So the people who are really extreme, because those people are actually not very high in number and are potential, you know, in the vaccine issue are very unlikely to cause on their own sort of outbreaks and things by not being vaccinated. But what's really the issue is the people who are more in the middle mm -hmm. who get sort of sucked into the incorrect ideas sort of by accident. And so we focus on those people. And one of the things that I think that we, we want to do is is really slow them down. A lot of our interventions have to do with slowing them down and getting them to retrace sort of how they came to believe what they believe. Because a lot of times what happens, and it was very important to me to emphasize this in the book, is that there's a, an element of group psychology here. So a lot of the anti-science or science denialist beliefs take place in the context of a group. And that can be as simple as a Facebook group. You know, It doesn't have yeah. to be an in-person group of people that you're always with. Um, but once you sort of click join group, you suddenly group psychology is very powerful and it starts kicking in. And one of the things that happens with group psychology and why it's so bad for science is that you stop evaluating things for yourself. So you just, you know, let the group make decisions for you, but also assume that the group has looked into all the background details. And so now you don't have to do that. You know, they know the truth about every topic. And sometimes people do that and they don't even realize that they've sort of gone down that road of, of just sort of not looking into it for themselves. So slowing them down and making them realize, well, how did you get from A to B? And then they realize they skipped this huge step of trying to understand the information for themselves. That can be helpful in getting people to go back. And especially if they're more on the fence and they're not, you know, they haven't become really extreme yet. It's, I mean, 
a basic version of that they teach i was a i was also trained as a teacher and classroom management is look 10 percent of the people are going to do well 10 percent of the people aren't and the 80 percent in the middle are looking at how you deal with both ends of that and they will gravitate to where you put your attention and so part of having been a again you know sort of working in science as a writer as a journalist we always got upset with the way it would be covered in mainstream media and impresses not because mainstream media is bad but because of the understanding of what was actually being done and that science moves slow and that science changes and all of that stuff like there aren't i mean there are breakthroughs but breakthroughs are the end of a long cycle of stuff and and i feel like that's some of the issue is that people see stuff in the media again not at the fault of the media but the, the media is just not really built for a 30-year time frame right. of understanding right. what's going on like is that a part of this definitely i mean it's like you said science tends to be very incremental but also one of the fundamental tensions that we talk about in the book is that science is set up to falsify things <laughs> and we're set up to make an, a, a judgment and stick to it <laughs> so science is all about it here's my study prove me wrong. You know, that's what I had a professor in public health school who always said that here, prove me wrong. I want you to prove me wrong. That's how science advances. But that sounds like changing your mind. And that's very uncomfortable for people. Yeah. And I would also point out that, I mean, it's, it's easy to sometimes point fingers at the media, but I think there's a huge issue in sort of the science, the structure of science itself, because a lot of what comes out is sort of not a great representation of a scientific study comes from university press releases. And there's this, <laughs> there's this, <laughs> there's this sort of incentive, you know, especially for scientists who maybe are you know, trying to advance their career, get tenure and, and the universities want publicity and they want to attract more money to make it sound like everything is a breakthrough. When, as we said before, these incremental changes are often are more common and also very important. So that can be misleading and that can lead people to believe that there's been some change and then another reversal and another reversal when it's not actually that tumultuous. Yeah, I, I run a university press here at Carnegie Mellon. And when I have discussions mm -hmm. with people that are thinking about journals and we're, we're sort of an experimental press. So we do different kinds of things. We're not necessarily like MIT or, or, or Oxford. Um, but I always tell them like a journal that's all about proving negatives or like reinforcing stuff would be the best thing that I ever right because okay. journals are predicated on what is new so everybody's trying to figure out what is new without you know then you read the studies where people go back and they do longitudinal stuff and they're like oh 40 percent of this stuff that we said is new actually may not even be real and it to me that lends credence to when people say fake news and stuff like that i'm like well yeah there's actually a, a modicum of reality in that but it's but it comes from this structural stuff, right? Like, I think that's sort of what you're saying, yeah? yeah? Absolutely. So how do we, like, I think, so you've done the book, like you guys have written, this is obviously like central to what you're doing with your careers, like, and this is the dumb question because if there was one thing to do, we would be doing it. None of us would be having this problem, but like structurally say, like, how do we move forward? Because as a country, we have to figure out how we get over this bump. So what are the things that we have to think about doing? Solve America. That's the question. <laughs> we, we have actually um, some pretty concrete suggestions for what we can do. One of which is what we've been doing lately, which is to create a core of what we call infodemiologists, which are people that we train to be ready at a moment's notice to respond to misstatements about a scientific topic as they appear online in social media and websites, things like that, and in traditional media, and use our approach of trying to find common ground with the people rather than simply lecturing them about the facts. So that's one thing, and we actually uh, are funded now by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to test that out, test that approach out. The, the, the approach that we recommend begins with the education system. So uh, it's still the case that children are taught science as a memorization ordeal. Um, and, you know, I always point out, I wonder how many PhD level chemists really have the periodic table memorized versus have it up on their 
yeah. wall in their office because there's no point in having it memorized. It doesn't do much for you since it's, it's you can have it right up there. Um, and that's where I, I, I think a lot of the um, misunderstanding about how science proceeds comes from that. And, and we saw that very graphically with the face mask situations with COVID. When you think about it, what actually happened when the pandemic started, science knew almost nothing about whether face masks are effective or not. Now, just a little over a year later, we have reams of information that show us pretty clearly that face masks are a effective way of wanting transmission of an infectious agent that's aerosolized. So that's a huge success in, in a relatively short period of time. And yet, the public has this perception that of flip-flopping, that the scientists couldn't make up their mind. And that's because, as you were pointing out before, that people learn science as a series of facts written in stone, rather than as a uh, discipline that is constantly changing and discovering new things. And that goes way back to where we teach science to children. So that's another point of it. We also do uh, advocate very much interacting with journalists. And one of the uh, problems in this country, as our colleague David Scales has pointed out, our chief medical officer at Critica, that most uh, countries now have a central, trustworthy news source, like the BBC, for example, yeah. that's publicly funded um, and that people really do rely on. We don't have that here in this country. Uh, we have you know, so many competing things, and you can't really trust any of them to be 100% unbiased, whether you're on the left or the right, yeah. you have to acknowledge that whatever you watch, it's, it's very biased. So we are very interested in this, as we've seen so much in this past couple of years, how science has gotten politicized in establishing a central media center in the United States that will deal with scientific issues and that people will see as credible and reliable yeah. to help journalists. One of the things that that you mentioned that actually really scares me, and maybe maybe you guys will tell me not to worry about this, but because in 18 months, science did a Herculean thing in going after COVID and under, and obviously some of it was built on, you know, the vaccines were built on previous research and things like that. But to the public, I feel like they think, oh, these scientists tell me that it takes forever, but really in 18 months, they figured this out not understanding that like, actually that's not true. It wasn't 18 months. It was, you know, a lot of novel coronavirus research and other research was happening right. long that's before this point. happened. And very so good point. the fact that science happens so publicly and people do think like, yes. well, you told me not to wear this and now you told me to without understanding that's the process of science. Like, do you guys think that may be a detriment that now people believe science works faster than it actually does? Yeah, I hadn't actually thought about that a lot before, but <laughs> that is a problem. And I think that the language around like warp speed and this sort of thing, like it's almost like a superhero movie, yeah. like science fiction. I don't, yeah, I don't think any of that is helpful in terms of educating people about what this is. And also, I don't think anyone realizes like coronavirus is not a new thing. I think right. most people don't know that if you, and this is actually a knowledge deficit, if you ask most people, did, did coronavirus as a category exist before COVID-19, they would say no. So there's just been so little communication about sort of what this is, where it comes from, the fact that it pre-existed this situation. And, um, and, and like you said, all of the many, many years of research, it's not like we were starting from scratch by any means, you know, there was really, a very, there's a long lead up to this. And yeah. I don't think that's been communicated at all. Yeah. And I, I think it's just gotten lost, you know, in the way that we have tried to, you know, we're just trying to get people vaccinated, get them vaccinated, get them vaccinated, yeah. but the message matters and it will matter down the line. And I think, Sarah, to what you were saying earlier, that it's very easy, I think, in social media and, and any look, it doesn't even have anything to do with social media. It's very easy to, to listen to the loudest people in the room and think, oh, my God, we're overrun by crazies. But if you look about every day, we're adding a percentage point to the people that have got the first vaccine. I mean, we're at 65 percent in this country in five and a half months. Like that's actually 
and with a you know the first two months was really lead up <laughs> like so really a lot of that's happened quickly and i think it's important for everybody to remember that's like like you said most people are in that middle and are like i think maybe we should listen to the doctors mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, is that, is that sort of, do you feel that to be true? Yeah, I think that's true. And also one thing that we found over the years in our research is that most people trust their doctors more than anyone else. So they trust their doctors more than they trust Google or WebMD or Facebook or whoever's, as you said, has the loudest voice in the room. Yeah. And part of the issue, another structural issue is that they're just, they just, their doctors just don't have enough time to coach them through this stuff. But yeah. if they did, that would be really powerful because they, they actually have that fundamental basis of trust is there and it hasn't gone anywhere. And I'm from rural Appalachia, right? And so like people also, and maybe this is part of your research, but like the closing of those clinics and the closings of hospitals where your doctor isn't in your town, right? Your doctor may be two hours away. So you're not really seeing them the way that like many of us that grew up had a primary care physician who knew you for most of your life, right? Like that's that, I think in some of those areas that that thing is missing. I don't know. Yeah, if you I think the only that. field that still does a good job, like I feel like pediatrics still does a good job of like you have your pediatrician and that's your person for many, many years. But with primary care, it's just a mess. Like many people don't have a primary care physician yeah. or they go to a group or they see a different person every time or they just go to urgent care. And it does, it erodes that relationship that's so important, like to be able to really say like, I'm nervous about the vaccine. Like I, and you know, doctors also need to be trained better to have those conversations as well. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, I, I, essentially what it sounds like the book and what your work is about is a lot of structural issues that have eroded our ability to have trusted sources of information where we believe that they are actually watching out for us. And we believe that because we have personal relationships with them. Does that that is of so true. That is just so true. You know, what, one of the new chapters in the book, um, we go through all of the federal agencies that we're supposed to trust to give us reliable information, the CDC, the FDA, and the assault on these agencies so that you can't trust them. And where does that leave people, you know, who uh, would like to trust these authorities, supposedly authoritative sources, and that's where misinformation creeps in when what used to be solid uh, is not there. And you're absolutely right, as Sarah was saying, with you, you know the personal physician. We were surprised. I'm I'm, I'm a physician myself, and you know doctors uh, often feel that nobody listens to anything that we say. <laughs> that our whole our whole uh, work is trying to convince people to do things that they don't want to do. Um, and we were surprised in one of our uh, recent, very recent research projects that we found that, it, as Sarah said, in fact, people do trust their primary care doctor. That's got to be a wake up call because we're going to lose that, as you said, very soon if we don't support the primary care doctor enterprise. Um, and we're just wasting so much money on healthcare in this country by not dealing with these very fundamental healthcare issues. Uh, and throwing money at, you know, huge medical centers with all kinds of equipment and everything, but we can't get the people to exercise and lose weight and not smoke yeah. cigarettes, um, which would be, uh, you know, enormously more beneficial for their health and save a lot of money as well. Yeah. Um, I read a couple of years ago, The Emperor of All Maladies about the, yes, the, the, yes. about, right, about the, the, the cancer treatment gets better because prevention is the thing. Like it's not exactly. that surgery is getting better. It's that people are That's not right. getting cancer. Right. And exactly right. You know, reading that was one of the I, part of the reason I read that was because I was just so interested in again, because we also think of science as a monolith, like it is a thing, like it is one thing. And it really is a bunch of different people trying a bunch of different things, figuring out what works. Right. And that right. funnel is really important. And, and sort of seeing that and understanding that to me makes me feel better to know that there's a lot of people doing stuff wrong, because that's how we get things right. And it gets back to you saying like, well, we don't need to memorize the periodic chart, right? Like that's not a, that's, that's telling you there's an answer. And, and that's right. not how science works, like that there's right. not an answer, right? Um, well, this guys, this is fantastic. I absolutely am going to pick up this book. I cannot wait to read it because this is right in my wheelhouse. And I think honestly, I'm sure you guys feel the same way. It feels like the most important thing that's happening in this country right now is understanding 
these kinds of things and not just with the coronavirus, but everything with our health, with science, how that stuff works. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think it would actually bring people together if we uh, joined around this issue of wanting to have solid, reliable scientific information rather than being polarized around science would be a really wonderful thing. It, I used to teach uh, the founding of the National Science, you know, the, the NSF, Vannevar Bush, like what he, uh -huh. what he wrote in the Atlantic as World War II was ending. Like, look, we have 100,000 scientists. If we get together and, and, and have a direction, think about what we can do. That is a summation of a 15 page article that he wrote that was essentially yeah. like paving the way for the National Science Foundation, paving the way right. for the internet, like and laying out what the world looked like. And I always would teach students and say, look, the world isn't this way on accident. The world is this way because we marshaled a view 70 years ago and slowly progressed towards that. And obviously it changed along the way, but it wasn't an accident. The world today is not an accident. That's a wonderful message. That is a wonderful message. And hopefully you're going to have some influence over other science teachers <laughs> so that they'll, they'll give the same, uh, the same message, right? I feel like you guys probably got a better shot of that than me. <laughs> we'll, we'll all do it together. We'll work on it together. <laughs> well, thank you guys for taking some time to talk about this. Um, it's so important. I'm so glad that you were here. I can't wait to read it. Uh, it's out now, right? Second edition or the yes, new edition yeah, is out now. Yep, yeah, it's out now. Awesome. Well, you guys have a great day and I hope we can talk soon um, after we have figured out America. Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure. All right, guys, have a good day. You too. Well, that was a whole lot coming at you, but maybe the smartest stuff that I've ever had on this program. That was Dr. Sarah and Jack Gorman. Uh, their book, Denying to the Grave, Why We Ignore the Facts That Will Save Us, which is in its second edition right now, is also out right now. Before we get out of here, just a couple of reminders. If you like what you heard, and I don't know how you could not have liked what you heard today, do us those two favors we ask you at the top of the show. Tell your friends about us. People are getting back out in the world. They need stuff to listen to while they're doing it. This show's a pretty good thing for them to listen to. And leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. And particularly if you listen through Apple Podcasts, leave us a written review there. These are the ways that we get found. While you're at it, don't forget to check out all the other programs on the Solid Listen Podcast Network, including the flagship Mother May I Sleep With podcast with host and our Solid Listen Podcast queen, Molly MacLear. Don't forget, we've got these video podcasts coming out every Monday and Friday-ish. You can always find them on the Solid Listen Network YouTube channel, or you can catch the audio wherever you listen to the Downtown Riders Jam. Speaking of, the jam is out every Wednesday, so make sure you are subscribed so that you never miss any of our episodes. And remember, you can always catch us on Twitter and Instagram at The Writer's Jam. Until the next time, I will see you around the internet.